Yeah, let's go. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Max Talks podcast. I am joined once again by Max and George. And today we have a very, very special guest all the way from America. Uh, I am joined by Paul Buckle. Hello, Paul. <laughs> Hello, good afternoon and good morning. <laughs> all three in one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How are you doing? You okay. Yeah, I'm very well, thank you. Yeah, I never thought I'd be sitting in uh, in, in Northern California in 2020, but yeah, I'm very. There you are. <laughs> what a journey! And yeah, obviously we'll be we're lucky enough to to talk about that with you. Obviously our our good friend now, Chris Todd, we like to call him. <laughs> put us in, our fucking put us agent. In your direction. He's our agent now, <laughs> Agent Chris. Yeah. Um, kindly, kindly put us onto you, Paul. And yeah, thank you very much for coming on for us it's very kind of he's not yeah. on his, listen he's not on commission is he Todd confidential mate <laughs> um, but basically for the way we like to start our podcasts off with the football journeys is we like to ask our first question to everyone um, which is what is your first footballing memory Oh, wow, that's, that's a pretty easy one for me. It was a 1979 FA Cup final, Arsenal v Manchester mm. United. Um, my father, it was the first game I ever went to, so that's how I become an Ars- a closet Arsenal fan. Uh, yeah. This is all yeah. Arsenal on this podcast, all we like to hear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got loads of stick yesterday from my brother in laws and all Spurs fans. Oh, but, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was it. That was my dad. We got given two tickets by the local vicar. And don't don't ask me, don't ask <laughs> yeah. me where that comes from because we're not a religious family. Somehow, no. my old man, my old man, God bless him, must have swindled them tickets out of the the, the local vicar. And uh, yeah, we um we went um and yeah, what was, what was I like, nine years old? We went and what a game! Like, it was a three-two game. Unreal. It was a brilliant game. It was the Alan Sunderland goal, and it's years ago now. But it was that was it. Hundred thousand at Wembley. And that's my first memory. And from then on, I was sort of obsessed with it. Straight away. It's totally understandable when you get to go to Wembley. I mean, that must be... How, how old were you at that point, Paul, when you first went to Wembley? That, that I was nine then. Nine. I was oh. nine then. I was nine then. And then linked to that, when I, when I signed at Brentford, you had to pass Wembley. You know, especially okay. once I started to drive past Wembley and I used to look at it all the time and look at it and look at it and think please one day just visualise <laughs> yeah. yourself oh, being yeah. there yeah. yeah yeah that was the place I mean I don't know how kids look at it now but certainly back then when I was nine and ten growing up you know we I, I was Alan Sunderland you know or Frank Stable and whoever I was on the park imagine yeah. you know uh, try, trying to put that that into practice on that the, was the uh, beauty of the, the FA Cup work. wasn't it it that was, it was, because yeah. it was all, all day long, wasn't it? It used to come on at lunchtime and then, yeah, never missed it. It was, it was fantastic growing up with, in that type of environment. It's amazing. Well, yeah, what a first game to go and see. So, um, so, yeah, obviously, you found yourself as a closet Arsenal fan. Um, and then where did your footballing journey begin, Paul? Well, it began, it began at, at primary school and uh, we was lucky enough to have a really good... Um, football teacher I suppose at the time and his name was Billy Giddens and I was best friends with his son Sean and um, I've never been asked this actually but it's a great question and I um, I started to play I love I remember the kit like getting the kit that sort of I must have been nine ten whatever I was or eight maybe maybe younger but I remember getting the kit I remember the whole thing loving the whole thing getting getting changed in the in the hall the school hall like the training you know I always wanted to be there first I absolutely yeah. loved it and um and uh, yeah, I, I I scored a load of goals for the for the local for, for the school team, and I remember you just remember them times where my mum used to watch every game and my dad, and they were like, Paul, sometimes you got to pass the ball, you know. Sometimes, <laughs> and I was like, well, well, you know, because I could run through the whole team. I wish I could have done that yeah. when I was a pro, but I could <laughs> run through the whole team. You know, I was thinking, well, why, why do I have to pass it if I can if I can do that? So. Um, I actually scored double figures once, but they but they Love took four off of me. Billy took four off me because we had what? one extra player on the field. <laughs> that that's crazy. horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I've never, never forgiven him for that. <laughs> that is brutal. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my word! So yeah, it all, all started at primary school for you then. 
it did and then it escalated very quickly. I played football every day. I talk about that now with players, you know, you have to have an obsession with it, yeah. you know, uh, be first on the training field, last off. Honest to God, guys, that is, there's no magic formula. You need a bit of luck in, in football, but as a rule, mm. you've got to be obsessed with it to, to get somewhere and maximise your potential. And I did that. I feel I did that. That was all I wanted to do. I like to ride a bike and different stuff, of course, like all kids. But that's what yeah. I wanted to do. And I had to be outside. My, my, my mum worked very hard, a number of jobs. My dad had come from a working class family, council house. And they didn't want us in, in me in the house. Mm. Three sisters. So I was pushed out onto the street, if you like, to go and play. And I remember not having a ball at times and going knocking up some of my friends and then acquaintances to try and get a ball. And, um, even, yeah. borrow, even borrowed a ball. Mm. And there was a brick wall. The council houses had a brick wall right in front of our house, more or less. So there was no view. And uh, that, was, that, was, that was a great learning tool, smacking it against mm. there. And then I went to senior school. I did well and I got picked up by Watford back in the day where oh, I was wow. 13. Yeah, I was 13, 14. I mean, the kids go a lot younger now, as you would know. Mm, yeah. and, and I think there's pluses and minuses to that. But I was still able to continue with school activity. But I signed Associate Schoolboy Forms with Watford at 14. And that's when I really knew where I wanted to go. I wanted to be a foot professional footballer. Yeah, that I was going to say, that really must have given you sort of that drive when you find that you know, you've got the chance to go to Watford and really sort of excel. As you said you said earlier, you know, you love football. That was the one thing that you really, really wanted. Did you find at Watford there were other boys that really wanted it or there were still some that just sort of were relaxed and didn't really care? Hmm. <clears throat> you, know, you know what? It's interesting because I'm reflecting now as I'm speaking with you, the levels just got higher and higher, chaps. You know, like from when I was running through the whole team scoring a goal. As I, as I went through the district and the county at the time, you played, you know, you represent the school, uh, you go to trials, you go to, to, to and you have that nervous feeling about getting in, am I going to get in? Yeah. Um, I, I always remember scoring in these, these, these county trials, scored a couple of goals, and they took me off after 15 minutes. I was like, oh, that, would... <laughs> that, was yeah. the, that was the message you're okay for, like, we've, we've seen enough of you. Yeah. And so all of those feelings, and then, you know, getting the letter through and, I got to like England trials and stuff like that, but it got harder and harder. And answer to your question, everybody, as I started to go up, wanted it. Yeah. They wanted mm. it. And they, so same drive, and, same passion. Yeah. 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 And, as, and I wasn't, you know, was, uh, you know, I wasn't, you know, a, a, a big player. I couldn't bustle people off the ball. And I found when I went up the levels, especially at Watford at the time, God bless Graham Taylor now, it was mm. route one. No doubt about it. We've got it forward. And, and the physicality of the boys was quite daunting because I wasn't physical at all. I was a real late developer. And um, I was more on the ball, you know, like the ball on the floor. That was my game. And I had to adapt very quickly to picking up second balls and uh, yeah. Yeah, go, to show, go, to, go, go to show to the fullback and it would just go. And there was a physicality, physicality element to it because you had to scrap for the ball. It wasn't a clean game. And I found mm. that tough. And, and, and Watford was training on a Monday um, and a Thursday uh, evening. Uh, on Thursday was Vicarage Road. And we used to do weight session. And oh my gosh, like, <laughs> so if I was in there with Do Do Dominic Naylor, Dom, <laughs> not seen Dom for years. Dom was like a man. He was in my position. He, he was like beast. And there yeah. I'd come in, <laughs> I'd cover it up my bicycle. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I just could uh, hardly, I could hardly, I could hardly um, lift the weights with Tom Wally screaming at me, you know, come on, come on. This. And I was like, oh God, and I was like, but yeah, that was, uh, that was my experiences at, at, at Watford. And then I, I, I didn't make an apprentice actually. Unfortunately, well, I, I mean. was, and this is a, the gospel truth at the yep. time. This is like how the game has changed. Okay. And rightly so. And I'm not, speaking badly of anyone, because Watford was great, and um, they signed me, but um, promises were made, they were, that I had an apprenticeship, mm. and right at the last, right at the 11th hour, it was taken away from me, and mm. I never forget, because but, yeah, it was shocking, because at the time, signing associated schoolboy forms really didn't give you any guarantees, all it done was give the club a guarantee that they could have you for two years, between 14 and 16. Yeah. So okay. I learned I learned a lot from that because in the, in that twenty four month window I had a lot of 
good clubs that were interested. Do you get me? So yeah, yeah. Yeah. I suppose my, my father, we wasn't experienced in professional football. There was no one in the family that had done that. And um, on reflection, that was probably the only downside of uh, that episode. But then I went to Brentford and the rest is history. The rest is history, yeah. I, do you find, Paul, that it is really, especially from the ages of 13 onwards, if you haven't got someone that can advise you on how to sort of develop yourself in the game and all these decisions that other clubs make and look after yourself, that you do really just get thrown down, a, you know, a dark alley in a way. I, I totally agree with you. And I say it with total respect because times have changed and we are in, in, in the world now where you'll get 10-year-olds with an agent. Yeah. And I, 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 <laughs> 10-year-olds like, worth millions. That's the thing. Yeah. Well. yeah. But, but advice, and as we know, you know, um, there's nothing like great advice. There's, there's nothing like it. it. It can save you time. It can save you going down the wrong road, as mm. you rightly say. And I think that, that I remember it. So I was, I shouldn't have been playing in this five-a-side game, right? So when you're associated with schoolboy, school you're not allowed to play for no one else. So okay. I'm, I'm in Hertfordshire, and my best mate says, Paul, we got, with my local team, we're playing a five-a-side. I must have been 14. We've got a five-a-side over in Stevenage. Uh, yeah, I fancy yeah, playing. Yeah. And I really fancied playing. I was like, I knew a one allowed. So I went over there. And, uh, you know, not without being big-headed, I'd done quite well. And before, <laughs> I knew it, before, before I knew it, the goalie of the team said, hey, do you want to lift, do you want to lift back? Like, you know, I suppose, well, dad, my parents weren't there. <laughs> and uh, his dad was an Arsenal scout. Oh, <laughs> and, God, like, stitch up. Paul, and he said to me, Paul, he said... Um, you know, where are you? And he's done very well. And I said, I'm oh, Watford. And he, and he said, all uh, oh, right, okay, you happy at Watford? <laughs> and actually, do you know what? I won't. Actually, yeah. I won't. That's the gospel wow. truth. And it's not going to say release me. I won't. And uh, he goes, would you like to come to Arsenal for a trial? Can you imagine? And I'm an Arsenal Oh, fan. don't. And I went back and uh, he dropped me off. And I said, yeah. And he said that they would contact Watford. And... I well, look, let, me put it, let me put it this <laughs> yeah, way. Let me this put it this way. They good. weren't happy. They weren't happy. I got called into the office. My dad, my dad, was, my dad was going, oh, you shouldn't have done that. I was thinking, cheers, Dad. Any chance of a bit of support here? <laughs> yeah, just <laughs> <back me> up. <laughs> we'll just go to London Coney for a trial. But, but, but actually, you know, this was like 84, 85. Uh, Tom called me in. And this was the way it was at the time. Tom called me in. And he said, yeah, you know, you're not going to Arsenal. Who was the guy that... And I, you know... So I believe now, yeah, you do need good direction. You do need, because I wanted to go. I should have been allowed to go. Yeah. Right? Let's be honest sure. about it. Totally. Yeah, so, of course. Totally. Yeah. So um, I think that advice and I think having good people around you is, is really important. Because in football, all of the teams are trying to get the best young talent. They're trying. They've all got different ways. But if you've got someone that knows it, understands but you still make your decision but you've got that support yeah. behind you where someone if maybe if they tried to maybe try it on in any certain way that they, that, that that advisor could could help you out it's For almost sure. like um it's almost like uh, with jude bellingham at the moment at birmingham where birmingham know that they're going to lose him at the end of the season but they want the best deal for him as well and where they're turning yeah. around and saying look you should probably look abroad look what's gone with Jaden sancho ahead of you like if you move to one of these big clubs, you'll probably just be set on the bench. So I, I, right. I can entirely understand. Do you think? Do you think players now should be looking abroad where they can get game time if they've got that support but support network behind them? It's an interesting question because I think that the players now I can't speak for the players. I don't know what motivates them. Is it yeah. money? Yeah. Is it? Is it? Is it? Uh, you know, we, we know with Toddy when he said about the money. I weren't sure about that one at Torquay, by the way. So, <laughs> but, uh, you know, and, and keep calling, keep calling me Buckle. Um, I was gaffer last time I spoke to him. But no, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, Chris, yeah. Uh, yeah um, I don't know what their motivation is. I think when I was a manager, I was always very interested in what you know. When I was managing Torquay and interviewing mm. the players before we signed them, it was what what's your motivation because. That, that's really important to get that alignment, you know, your expectations. And I think sure. now the game has changed, the money in the game now, everything that's involved in the game now is totally different. And it's different in the levels, as you know, of course, in League Two, 
up to the Premier League. It's night and day now with what they're doing. I got, and I got to see that at Southampton, you know, working at Southampton with the 23s. I got to see everything. And I needed to see yeah. that. I needed to, I'd worked with, with Premier League, young Premier League players that I took on loan or then quite made it like an O'Kane or, and you take them and a key, Billy Key. But to be in there, see the resources, see the structure. They've got agents, they've got advisors. They're on really good deals, right? Yeah. Because they're being protected. And, and, and somewhere like Southampton, what I learned was if you've got somebody, all right, like a Chelsea, that raised the bar a few years ago with the monies, okay? Yeah. So you've got, you've probably, if, you, if, you, if, if Chelsea are after them, Arsenal are after them, Tottenham, you know, Liverpool, and, and you've got Chelsea, for example, raising the bar with the money, the agent's probably going to say, well, can you beat the money? Yeah. Can you beat yeah. the money yeah. deal? Can you beat? And, mm. and you, them clubs probably can't. So Southampton would wait probably for club for teams like uh, Arsenal or Chelsea. So Nathan Teller, that's just, just been signed by Southampton. I think Nathan was released by Arsenal. And that's when maybe they'll swoop in and try and... Try and nick him. You know, get him. Yeah. 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 Yes, 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 exactly, exactly. No, that makes that makes total sense. That makes total sense. So, how did you find your time at Brentford? Because obviously, it was the club you you sort of kicked everything off, really. Yes, yeah. Steve Perriman, who's become a, it's hard calling Steve a friend, but he's been a, because when someone has such an impact on your career at a young age, you know, you're always whenever you look at them, you see him as that that guy that was giving you a right bollocking or giving yeah. you a pat on the back, which, yeah. which were far, but far and few between anyway, the pats on the back back then. But, um, <laughs> no, he phoned, this is Perriman all the way through in my opinion. So when I was released by Watford, phone rung and it was, uh, it was Steve. And he, yeah. up, and he was the first team manager at Brentford. It was his first job. He'd left Tottenham. It was his first job. He'd come in, the assistant, Phil Older and Colin Lee, was the youth coach and they just he said look we've heard really good things you don't even have to trial with us we trust you know and that was I suppose a good thing from Watford the exit route Tom and the, the guys they did pass our names on the boys that had been let go yeah. um, and anyway I, I went ironically it was a there was a he said he said you don't have to come and trial but there is a game against Watford <laughs> I was there oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, mean... I was there, I was there. <laughs> and that's yeah. when I knew that you know when you suffer disappointment at a young age I think it's tough, but you can learn a lot from it and you learn a lot. And I got that drive in me to go and prove them wrong, which I think you need to do in football a lot. 100%. Sure. Yeah. You need to have that. And so I got that quite early, that emotion that, right, I'll, I'll show you. Because that was what my mum used to say to me. There was no excuses allowed in my family, really, but especially my mother. Very strong leadership. So I, I went to Brentford. There was a group of us probably all been released by the clubs we've spoken about. But yeah. I'll tell you what, we went off. We were a very good group. We we got to the semi final FA Youth Cup. You know, we knocked out Man United. We got to the Southern Junior Fallet Cup. We tied the, the league with Southampton. So, painting a picture for you, we had a good side. And the reason we were good, and the reason that eight of us got into that first team, was that Steve Perriman and Phil Older were there all the time. We yeah. played the first. The first team would be playing on a Saturday at Griffin Park, and we'd all be playing in the morning so you'd play in the morning like now and then you go and do your jobs you go to the first team game do your duties every every, every morning over they come Perriman and older think i'll be thinking yeah. what are they doing you know it's a three o'clock kickoff and if sometimes and i'm sure they did it perfectly like be 10 to 11, 10 to 11 so kickoffs at 11 and you'd just be out there warming up and i'd look out the corner of my eye and i could see the pair of them coming over it just there raised is. the bar <laughs> oh here he is here he is he's oh, everywhere they were everywhere, I'm telling you. And it stays the same. It's been the same at Exeter. Yep. They were there. And what they were doing is, one, they were, they were looking at you. So at the end of that two years, it was really fair. You know, they really knew us. They mm. were giving us information on a daily basis. They joined in the training sessions with us. They, they, it worked side by side. And I suppose now I've taken that model on wherever I've been to get the first, to get the, the kids alongside the first team. No, no yeah. better way. No better Definitely. way. Definitely. And, um, and, and also the coaches as well. So Colin would be right over there. And they'd just call us over on a regular basis. So you really felt that you had a chance. And mm. I, I made my debut at 16. 
I'm, I, I'd made my league debut at 16 That's years old. Very, That's very, very impressive. Yeah. yeah, it was very impressive. You know, so good. And they, it, but they really were fair with us. It was tough. Mm. And the first team were tough. We won, we won what would be what the league one now. So we won that and I was lucky enough to play in the championship for Brentford. So I, it was a winning mentality. Everything that was done there was a winning mentality. It didn't matter what you was doing. The standards were sky high. The jobs had to be done. You never allowed home. So if the jobs, there was duties, okay? And you've probably heard this before where you cleaned everything. And we did. Yeah. We cleaned everything at that club. But I remember the transparency where Steve, and again, we had this meeting when we were just coming up to be APs, big meeting at Griffin Park. And it weren't never just Colin. They were there, right? First team manager. And he said to all the parents, this is what our expectations are of the players. This is what they'll be doing. This is what we believe will make them get, improve their life skills and make them a player. And if they don't make a player, they're going to take a lot away from this um, mm. experience. If you mm. don't agree with it, you're more than welcome to take the kids, your, your son, somewhere else. And I love that part. because oh, I, I, I used that. I used that at Torquay, guys. Because the apprenticeship, the apprenticeship rules changed. When I was at Torquay, you could only train them 30 hours a week. And I, mm. I just... I just I didn't see the, see the value in that because, as I say, the clock's ticking. When you've got two years to make it, the clock's ticking and you've got to put the hours in. So we did. I signed professional forms at the end of it. Um, it was an unbelievable two years as an apprentice there, made lifelong friends and, um, and life skills from, from Steve, Phil and Colin Lee, who I can't thank enough for mm. that experience. How did you feel? How did you feel making your first team put uh, – appearance for Brentford how did, what did you feel inside <laughs> so, like I'll tell you exactly how I felt it was a Friday it was the last game of the season at at, um, at Griffin Park I was in I was doing my duty I think I was cleaning the boot room out or something something miserable and um, <laughs> Colin he walked in and he goes whenever he spoke to you, I thought I'm in trouble I've done something wrong here. he goes <laughs> get your stuff and get yourself home go and get all your stuff and go on what? and he said the same to he said the same to a lad called Matt Howard was a right back so long story short well like, mm, yeah you're in the first team squad tomorrow so Love I, wow the feeling the feeling right the feeling was oh shit <laughs> are <laughs> you I sure I I <laughs> i've got to walk into the i've got to get into the dressing room now oh. right which was so daunting i've got to tell you because there's no there's no prisoners back then so it the was first thing was in your old as well. That's that oh, is oh very God. daunting. Yeah, yeah. So so um it was such a tough environment. Even the physio, Roy Clare, God bless Roy. He was murder, Roy, you know. <laughs> Roy, can I can I get some ice? No. Roy, could can I get a no <laughs> Boy, the legs hanging off, don't care. You know. It was, <laughs> it was brutal. And uh, so 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 we go to go out and all the apprentices, right, because we were we were so tight. You could see they were gutted. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. Robbie Peters, I know, Gailey Marcus Gal. What? Where are you going? Oh, see you, lads. We're going on. <laughs> 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 and then we're, and, and so you saw the disappointment. So that was the, in, the competition that was created within. Everyone wanted that. Mm. You know, played first team, joking. I thought, no chance. It's probably just in the squad. Don't get your ropes up, going to be in the squad. I got back. Told my parents, told my dad, because I was in digs at the time. But I had to go yeah. home because I didn't have a suit. I had to pull out a suit. Oh, my God. <laughs> How suit. big was it? How big was it? <laughs> Can you imagine? And my dad's there going, where are this one, son? Where one of mine? You know, yeah, old Tuesday. You're in, in my <laughs> I'll flop it out. Then. <laughs> oh, God. And, um, I cer there was certainly no Ted Baker around then to help me oh, out. Don't. Yeah. But, oh, don't. Oh, God. Hand me down. Me, I, met, I just didn't know what to do. The morning of the game, uh, I, can't, I just didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to behave. I didn't know what a first team player, you know, should be doing. I'd only been an apprentice for 10 months, 11 months. But anyway, went in there, walked in. Pros. Pros were like, what are you, what are you doing in there? What, what are you doing? <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> look at his shoes. Look at his tie, you know. But they were great. They, they were great. I knew that they loved us. And I went in. Me and Matt went in. And Steve come in looking unbelievable, like in his suit, and I was like, yeah. just shake it. And then he names the team, and we're both on the bench. Oh my and again, word. it carried on. Without boring that, it carried on, because it's a great question. I didn't know, 
I didn't know whether to take my suit off straight away. So I'm looking <laughs> around and you've got like experienced pros like bothered, you know, it's like still an hour and a half ago and there's me stretching and, <laughs> and I'm only sad. <laughs> so <laughs> you sort of know then how to behave. You're learning on how to behave, mm. like steady down, calm down, but you know, and that. Anyway, the game got underway and um, just before half time, uh, there's an injury. So we had to cut more. Well, I didn't know how to warm up properly. There's fans in, and, uh, and uh, Steve Perriman says, Matt, he said, uh, make sure you're ready. And now, and now it's reversed on me because I'm what I said about the lads, you know, being envious of us. I'm now envious because I was like, what? <laughs> you're going oh, so, all scared. So I think, yeah, I think it was Roger Stanislaus um, was injured. And of course, during that half time, we're all sitting there and Roger's in the treatment room, last game of the season as well. Like, he's probably had enough, enough games. So, of course, they go, Matt, you're on. Whoa, so the competition, whoa. I was pleased for him, but I was gutted. Yeah, so yeah now, you want to get now, on. Now, yeah, now, now I want to get on. So he got on and he's doing really well. <laughs> Just like, oh. hang on a minute, it ain't such a big hurdle. And what, what Perriman, Stevie Perriman said to us was, don't do anything different to what you're doing in the youth team. I think that's a great bit of advice. That's I've, lovely, I've yeah. used that over the years. Don't do anything different. It's it's same size pitch, 11 v 11. Don't do play your game. Anyway, I got on. I got on about 15 minutes to guys itching to get on. I was, I was dying to get on. I ran into the linesman. This is gospel truth. <laughs> I ran. I'm not sure if I got booked or whether oh. I dreamt it. So I was. They said <clears> warm up. You go last warm up. You're going on. Oh God! I come flying out the traps. I went steaming along, and I didn't want to warm up on the gravel, on the bloody orange gravel stuff. Mm. I wanted to warm up on the grass, get my studs in the grass. Of course, it was only like tiny bit of grass. The linesman's looking along, you know, at the game, and I've come flying down, doing my last sprint, and gone straight into him, knocked him clean out. <laughs> <laughs> no one's seen it. The ref come over. He was bent over. He was bent over. He was trying to flag. <laughs> oh wow! Ball. And I was winded. I was winded badly, but I was pretending I was all right. So yeah, that was my. That was <laughs> that was out. Oh, I, got on, I, made, oh, that's made, I made my debut, and um, I then had to wait. I think I had to wait around about sixteen months to actually make my full debut against Birmingham away, which then you know then months I needed that. Um, it was a reward, I suppose, from Steve, and it was, and I think it was a strong message to the rest of the chaps to say, "Who's next?" Mm. For sure. Mm. Was you on the so, bench yeah. during so, those months? Was you on the bench during those months? No, I don't think I was. No. No, I think I, oh. I, I, to, I think it was a test. Again, it's testing you all the time. Mm. So, yeah. um, and I shared this with Steve the other day. I think I was a second year apprentice and I started to do well again. I, I, you know, when you're doing well. And um, I've been in the squad, I think, a few times, but not quite, not quite got in the team. And I, and when you was in the squad, even when you were sub. As a pro, as a as a pro, then I don't know if they do it now. I was sort of doing double shift because I was I was playing for the youth team. I'd be mm. su- be be in the squad for the first team, right, and then I'd have to play for the reses. And I remember oh, coming out. I, I remember cup, yeah. And, and you are sort of growing up, and you sort of start to have an opinion, and yeah. then you realise that's a mistake. That's a mistake at sixteen, seventeen, having an opinion. So I, yeah. I sort of come out one game in a resi game. I might I forget who it was against. And I walked out. Now, the rule was always to run out. And I walked out and I went and got a ball. I went and got a ball. And you weren't allowed to touch a football. You had to oh, go geez. and jog, stretch. And who was up watching? Of course he was. Steve was there. Steve. Oh, yeah. He knew. He set the trap. He knew. He thought. And I thought I'd arrived. And he was spot on. I did. And I got the biggest dressing down from him. <laughs> Yeah, and 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 it, but it was needed. It was yeah. needed, and then and yeah. it, got, it realigned me. It realigned me. It was about keeping your feet on the floor, good habits. It was always about doing the right things, and um, I, and I carried that. And again, all these things that they put in you. It's like when you're managing, you pay total respect to the lads that are not playing because they're devastated. But they've got they've got to be able to recover and do the right things. For they've sure. got you know, and 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 if they can do that. Especially in the industry of football, where it's highs and lows all the time, gives gives you a great chance of, of having a career. Yeah, definitely. I do find it amazing how Steve Perriman has sort of followed you the whole way with your career. Like it's been, yeah, it's been pretty incredible. Pretty amazing when he because he first came in when I was a player with Noel Blake. So okay, he was down the mm. bottom. So if you remember back, I hadn't seen Steve for years. Yeah, and I'd um. I was, I was, that must have been in, what was that? Was that have been like 2000? 
I think it must have been about two, yeah, 2000. And um, we were down the bottom. We were struggling badly. And um, just one morning, we was all in the gym waiting for training. And I think the big man was struggling to pick the team and all that because, you know, we, we, weren't, we, we weren't doing very well and we had to take responsibility for that. But Steve, anyway, walked in. He came in. Joe Gadsden brought him in. And he was going to work with, with Noel. And um, mm. I remember his first talk. I remember him walking in. And I thought, oof. Things have changed now. <laughs> he means go. business. <laughs> oh, yeah. He means, he's a top professional. He means business. And he sort of nodded at me, and I thought, that's good. And he, he must have known Alex. Alex was there at the time. Alex Inglethorpe was a player. Alex was there at the time. So yeah, and I think he'd known Alex from back in the back, Watford, maybe. And anyway, we, uh, we got out of it. Steve worked brilliantly with Noel. He made it clear that he didn't want his job, because he didn't. And um, but we, we started to find a rhythm. We got a team together. We played some great stuff. And I tell you what, that year, to get out of trouble like we did, because when you're in trouble, you sort of do, have to do the basics really well. You clear your lines and all that. And that's really important. But we played as well. Mm. I never forget, he come on the training field and he said, right, 11 v 11, two touch. All right, so you have to get it and move it. Get it, yeah. get to first good touch. Simple right, stuff, it. yeah. Sit right, Yeah, simple stuff, exactly. And we started to see us do things that, you hadn't seen from this sex at a team. I mean, Kwame mm. Ampadu was in it, I think. Um, we had a good side and we started popping it. And it, in a way, it was, it was a touch unfair because, you know, we, we, we were responsible for them results prior. But actually, we learned a lot about ourselves. And with Blakey, we all learned that actually we, we can play like this. Maybe we've been playing in a different way, I don't know. But, um, but yeah, we'd lost our way. We realigned the ship. We got out of it. I think we got out. We beat Scunthorpe away, and we got we got out of it with a couple of games. So it was unbelievable, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. So and then mm. and then Steve, I then obviously I I came through. I'd done my coaching badges, and I got involved in coaching with with City. You know, with the academy, which is great academy, fantastic academy. Mm. And um, yeah, that's how it sort of evolved. And then when Steve was obviously appointed Alex, um, yeah. I took a big a bigger role at the club. That's incredible. Would you say that Exeter was sort of the, the best moments in your playing career? Was it Exeter City or would you not? Oh, what a question. Uh, well, I didn't win anything. I come close because I was player assistant when we, when we got beat by Morecambe. I was yeah. player assistant and mm. was arguably playing my best stuff for City when I hurt my knee a few months before the end of the season, uh, you know, before the playoffs. You know, we've got, I forget who we played in, in, in the playoffs. Um, might have been Oxford, mightn't it? Um, but I got back. I got back for the final. I got back about a week before. And I, I really had played well for Exeter leading up. And I felt I could play a, a role in that game. And Tiz put me on the bench. I was so excited. Like, and he, yeah. It was funny because I was his assistant. Yet he treated me on that, that week like a player. Because I was coming back in. And I thought, I'm either going to... I'm probably going to come on in this game to look after it to look after the game. I felt we could, if we was in front, he could trust me to come on in front of the back four and marshal, because we had a young side at the time. It was quite a young team. Um, and that's why that team evolved and went on and done really well. You know, with no additions, but done very well. Um, but never got on. I think Phillips, Lee Phillips, done his Amy yeah. and different things happened. And of course, we needed a goal at the end, being two on down, but um, I didn't get on. But in answer to your question, I had so many great experiences at Exeter as a player through the tough times, you know, played for free, you know, for nothing uh, years yeah. ago when mm. they had no money. Yeah. And people like Julian, yeah, thank you. And people like Julian Tag, who was instrumental in, in my, getting me to think about being a coach. And that's what I think Exeter were great at. And I loved the Southwest. I loved that. But I didn't, I didn't actually win anything with them. You know, with, with, with Brentford, I won, I won a title with, uh, Colchester, we beat Torquay yeah. at Wembley in the playoff <laughs> final. Oh. I, I, mm. I won the league with all the shot to get into the conference as captain. So they stick in your mind because you, you won. But I think that I, had, I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for Exeter City. Yeah. The way I developed as a coach. The way I developed as a coach yeah. there. And this is why if you look at them as a club, and I'm, I'm encouraging it now with some of the, the, the clubs I work with here because I think their model is brilliant. They don't only produce players, they produce coaches. 
Yeah. If you look at the coaches, sure. they've, they've done really yeah. well. You know, from back in the day, God bless with Eamon and stuff. They've really yeah. had a clear pathway. So I think they've, they've been a brilliant club over the last 12 years. I agree. I mean, it was, re- it was really nice to speak to Chris about Eamon. And I was going to ask yourself as well, Paul, what, what was your yeah. experience of, of Eamon Bowler like? Hmm. Well, he's full of energy and life and everything you need for a positive environment. He worked tirelessly in the youth department, which no, not many people get to see, fellas, you know, you ever see the first yeah. team. Yeah. He, was, he, work, he worked in a time where we were struggling financially. Um, but he was always bright as a button. He was always a great smile. Um, and he saw a lot at Exeter. He saw a lot. And, and the club, and I know the club is thankful for his work, because you're only as good as the people that have gone before you in jobs. And I've mm. said this before. Um, and Eamon really did set the foundation for the, for the youth. And I heard Dino, Dean Moxie, talking yeah. about Eamon the other day. And, and they'll never be forgotten. He was a larger-than-life character. Went through huge battles himself, you know, um, throughout his, through his career and his mm. personal life. And, 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 and it was awful. It was just awful to lose him. But yeah, I always remember him as always smiling. I'll tell you what, there's something to be said for that because that smile, you know, if you don't smile in, in the game, I don't think you've got any chance because, mm. you know, if, if, if you're going to come in in the morning on a Monday morning after a defeat and, uh, oh, right, you're not going to be singing and dancing, but if you can't say good morning to people, if you can't <laughs> look them in the eye, yeah. I, I, don't see how you're gonna, I don't see how you're going to be successful there because you are going to lose and you are going to have disappointment. So his positivity was fantastic. Uh, I totally agree. Thank you very much for that. Great. It's very kind here. Um, very kind. Go on, George. So you say how yeah, Aim was always smiling. Did you try and take that ethos on yourself when managing? I probably, I probably didn't do that enough uh, mm. on game days and on like on reflection. I probably didn't convey that there was another side to me. You know. I was very serious in the job. You know, during, during the week with the players, um, of course, there was a cutting edge to me, but I, I loved the players. I'm not afraid to say that. I loved them. Every player that I was with, I loved them. And I did a lot of different stuff. And with Torquay being, um, being the big one, because I was there four years, that's a long time in management yeah, um, but, nowadays. Nowadays, so especially. I, yeah, we definitely had a clear way of working. There was a plan on and off the field. We loved energizers, not energy sappers. There weren't no room for that. There was no room for that. You had to be an energizer. And um and that was so enjoyable. I, I just I wanted it to be enjoyable. I say this now, it can be enjoyable. Um yeah. if we think in the same. And I think that, that the players can come in. Like one thing I knew about them groups I had at Torquay, they cared massively. Oh, they yeah. really cared. Yeah. They really cared. So for me, if I saw them a bit down or it lifted me. It lifted me because I knew they cared. Because I cared. I, you know, when you lose a game as a manager, it's the worst feeling in the world because mm, yeah. it's not like a player. You've got the responsibility of the fans. You've got everything. Um, but I probably didn't. I probably didn't show. I say enough respect. I loved all the fans. Every look that I've worked, clubs I've worked at, the fans are vital. Of course they are. But you know, the fans they want wins. They want good things, and especially at Torquay when there have been a lot of bad happening. I was so focused, I think, on getting the job done that sometimes maybe I didn't celebrate enough and didn't, you know, yeah. on match day, yeah. um, you know, go, up, go over to the fans and hug them or, you know, yeah. and I think there's a, lot to be, there's a lot to be said for that. There's a, there's a lot to be said for that. Yeah, of you course. Know, and it, mm. and I, I'd probably change that a little bit now um, if I had the chance, especially with Torquay. I left so quickly. I didn't get an opportunity to really thank the uh, the fans, and they didn't thank me. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say it works both ways. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's it'd be nice if I can thank you for them wins, you know, for yeah. with their wins, and you can thank me. But yeah, exactly. But, but as yeah. you know, it, it's not we don't sort of have that culture. But I certainly could have been been better at that for sure. So uh, and and you say obviously like you went from uh, beating Torquay in a, a final, a uh, promotion mm. final, and then you won one yourself with them, didn't you? Mm. What yeah. was it like yeah. winning at Wembley uh, in that final? 
Was it Wembley? Was it Old Trafford? No, it was Wembley. Wembley yeah. Steve, it was the Wembley. Stevenage. The yeah, Stevenage defeat the Stevenage, was. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that was. So yeah. yeah, what is it like winning at Wembley? It's everything. Is yeah, it? It's so everything I wanted. Mm. <laughs> I, I, I won there as a player and I won there as a manager, and I'm proud of that. And a t- a, a, and the thing is, when you're in the job, I found it really hard to reflect. You, 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 and I had this. I was talking to this mindset guy the other day. This guy, Steve Salis really good and there's another American chap that I, that I sort of talk with and I found it really hard to reflect because when you're a manager when you're winning there's something else to, 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 to go for when you're losing there's other things you've got to work mm. on and you don't get a chance to reflect but when we won at Wembley I was so relieved I was so relieved and this is the bit probably with me is that I couldn't celebrate yeah. I didn't. Yeah. You don't really That's, see yeah. I mean, when they when when the lads. I think it was Mark Mustafa Carriel absolutely absolutely covered me in, in, in you know <laughs> he really got me. He really got me, and I think he got me because I didn't. He was sub, Buzz. You know he's like that, Muzzy. He, he, I think he was going to have that. You know, not celebrate because I got absolutely covered, and that sort of that woke me up to say, look, Paul, we've just done something really special here. Yeah, I, I, I loved seeing the players. I loved seeing the faces of the fans. I really did. Because to get promoted to the Football League, as you know, that ain't easy. And we did it after, no, no, after, no, after two seasons. The season before, with all the disappointment, as Toddy said about... But really, truthfully, them, them first couple of years were there to die for because we won so many games from having a brand yeah. new team. We, won, we were right in there where you need to be. And there's no guarantees in the finals. The finals are, are so difficult. And I, I spoke with Julian Tag actually, a couple of days ago about finals. And I think, I think if I'd done it again, I would have, I'd have rung up ten managers to, to 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 pick their brains on a final. Yeah. Because players players behave is very different in a final, especially at Wembley. Do you get me? Yes, yeah, um, totally. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Right, and and I think that, I think that we got it really right on that day. I think the year before. We, when we lost to Exeter over the two legs and you know, mm. they proved to go on to be a very good side, that was, yeah. that, was, that was gut-wrenching. But then when we went in the final of the trophy, it's a big occasion. A big occasion that was. We should have beat an Ebsplin. There's no disrespect for them. But on our day, if we play our game, we, we should win that. But we didn't. Um, but we had the suits. We had lots of different stuff. We, we glossed it up. You and got we got to. beat. Got to in the final, yeah. Yeah, I mean... Well, the next year we didn't know. The point I'm trying to make is when we played Cambridge, it was so much focus. It was like it really was focus because the good thing for the fellas was they had that they had that experience at, uh, at Wembley losing. You don't want to go to Wembley and lose. Oh my God, finals! No, no. You, but um, it was the best day, one of the best days of my life. Um, I did enjoy it. I loved. I used to like the journeys anyway back to Devon. I used yeah. to like being on, on the bus with mm. Torquay because we'd have Brian, Brian Polk and Ian Eamon on there, two directors, which give it a different... a different Because uh, they used to come on the bus when I was a player. I was like, you still hear you two? Signed When I first signed, there was all 11 consortium members and Alex Rowe said, oh, one last question, Bucks. I said, go on. He said, now, it, it, say no. If, if, can Ian and uh, Brian travel on the bus? So I said, of course they can. I love them on the bus because <laughs> they, they used to pay for all the drinks on the Friday night <laughs> and food and everything. Of course you and like them. <laughs> we loved them. And the only yeah. thing that, the, the only thing that I asked for from Torquay on them trips was that the staff and me, the players eat on their own. I was a believer mm. that we leave the guys on their own, right? I like to distance myself before the game with them, let them have their space. And, and us mm. staff who worked tirelessly for me, you know, Kenny Basie, Northy, um, Damien Davey that they could have a treat on a Friday night you know have a nice meal That's together nice, yeah. and Brian and Ian and Brian were first class those, those two directors so to have that coach journey back with the cup that oh. was some journey back that, that was some I can imagine <laughs> 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 yeah. was, we're looking oh, where Torquay is from Wembley that's well, a such long, a, long journey it's such a long <laughs> yes. drive yeah, yeah we no, getting no, those no, drinks down, down yeah driver, pop that Normally we say to the driver, you pop that blister, come on, get your foot down, let's get on. We was like, slow it down. <laughs> 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 Spill over. That's unreal. 
That's fantastic. <clears throat> I was, I was going to ask you something that I've always been really, really interested in. Um, seeing Exeter go from the conference to League Two, they seem to go from strength to strength. Like they go into League Two and then they bounce, they bounce up again to League One. Do you think yeah. that there's a massive golfing difference between the conference and League Two? Um, no, I. Well, actually, I do, and I think it was proved. It was. It, it, I get your point. The continuity is massive. The continuity yeah. is huge. I really believe in that, and that's why I believe in in in, in picking your manager and sticking with them, okay. right through thick and thin. But when we when we stepped up. Because <clears throat> I always remember, there were two things I remember. One good, which is waiting for the league balls to turn up at Torquay. Mm -hmm. I hated them conference balls. I said, oh. Kenny, when them balls come in, make sure you text me, I'm in. Coming in. I'm, <laughs> I had the, league, the league ball, right? Because, you know, when you've had your, your history in the league for that long, you know, I'm with ex you know, you're football league clubs. You're football yeah. league clubs. Let's get back yeah. in there. And when we got back in there, in answer to your question, the romance went quickly. Why? Because we kept getting pipped 1-0. And if you look where we were after Christmas, right, with the same group of guys, and I, I've had, I said this on a, a podcast recently, that when I decided that Chrissy, Argreaves, Tim, Toddy um, had to move on, mm. yeah, it was because it was, and, and I'm not bla I'm not saying that they weren't good enough. I could have waited, but it was better. We'd gone from a conference, uh, winning games in the conference regularly on two seasons, right, to getting beat 1-0. Yeah. So they were, they were better. It was, it was a step up in League yeah. 2. So I, I, I think that when, you, when, you, when you're signing players down in Devon, this is why it makes it so difficult down there. When you're signing players, they won't come for a year normally. You've got to give them two years. And then yeah. if, you get up, if you get up, you've got them for another year. So I said to the board, this, you know, that, there's, you know, there's not much room on the budget, right? So there was a load of room on the budget when I first went there because they want a player there. So yeah. I, I, that's another point. P people say, oh, you know, Paul, he had the money. Well, of course I had money. I had no players. But I, used <laughs> yeah. it, I, 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 I used it well. I used the money well, yeah. in my opinion. But there was always succession plan. There was always forward thinking. And I said to the board, if we get to Christmas or just after and we're, not, and we're, we're, we're down the bottom, I've got to do something. And, and I had to do it. I had to do it because Silsey had got 42 goals for me in two seasons. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I don't think Tim had scored for 14 games. Now, I take the blame for that as well, right? Because that was, that was our success. We were together. And I, and I just thought, okay, because if you, if you look back, Tim had, Tim had only got a couple of goals at Hereford. When I, when I signed Silsey, a few people looked at that and said, mm. well, his goals record in League Two wasn't particularly good. So his record was very good in the conference. So yeah. whether, whether, whether this conference just, just suited him or whether I should have tried different ways with him in the league, who knows? But it was a step up. Okay. It was a step up. And then I, so I made changes. I made the, well, and I got, I got slaughtered for that. I, I got so, slaughtered. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, yeah. One of I, 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 yeah. Slaughter, One of my favourite movies is uh, Moneyball, and it talks about yeah. the conversations that a manager should have with a player before sending them on their way. And um, as Brad Pitt's character goes, you don't want to long it out. You don't want to make it a big thing. Just go in, say, you're being traded to this team. You're going here. We've accepted an offer. The person in this department will look after you from now on. Mm. Is it like that in football? What are those conversations like when you're sending players on their way and they're going to another team? Well, um, at Torquay, I was, the, I, I was the one really. I mean, Colin obviously worked closely with me, Colin Lee. Yep. But really and truthfully, mm. it was my duty to, to, to tell the players, okay? There's no player that, that will tell you anything different, but they'd be fibbing if they did, that I, I didn't shirk from giving them the bad news, right? Mm. In a room, one-on-one, -on -one, I'd call them in. If Sean was in there, I would ask him if they wanted Sean in there or not, or they just want me on my own. Okay, because it's a massive moment. Even when you're leaving a player out, you've got to mm. speak to them. You've really yeah. got to take the time. Because I've worked for a manager where he, it, it, it dropped you in the dressing room in front of all your teammates. Well, I'm sorry, that ain't for me. 
Yeah. I yeah. want it to be better than that. I want it to be better than that. So something like letting a player go, I did it with them. I did it with them. Uh, Silsey was bought by Steve Nitch. So obviously the players we had, even, you know, the ones that, um, so say like Lee Phillips, because I had to get, get it up and running. Look, Lee, the great signing for us. Uh, Chrissy, uh, Chrissy Todd, Chrissy Argreaves, Silsey. I got money for Lee Phillips, Rushton Diamonds. I got money back on Silsey. So I was always, <clears throat> I was always looking at the money at Torquay. It, it is, I think, I think that's huge. Right? I was always very careful with the budget. I never went over budget. Always sold players. The club came first, and and yeah. so I never, I never, I felt for the players. I felt for them, but I tell you what, I felt for the club. And yeah, the club's yeah. the most important thing, the football club. So when I managed, I tried to always have that in mind. So when I left Torquay, I left that in a sound position yeah. for Martin, for Martin to take over and, and add well like Martin did. But that was in a great, a great position where you had to sell players at Torquay. That's the model. That is the model, no doubt about it. You've got to yeah. get them in, identify them, work them, yeah. and sell them on. Okay? Yeah. And then find the next ones and find the next ones, which is what, what, what I tried to do there. But um, that was the process. The process was pure honesty with them all the time. And like I say, it, it didn't go down well, and I didn't expect it to because I couldn't convey everything. And when, when I allowed the four big players that had done unbelievable for me, and, and I've done unbelievable for them as well, I'd like to think. Yeah. To let them go when they have gone through a brick wall for you, which they did, because um, we had that environment, um, it's very difficult. But we had a great time. And it's time to move on, just like when yeah. I moved on or when I got sacked at Rovers or whatever. It's time to move on. You know, you get on with it. And you think, I think they're all thankful now for the time that we had. And I think the other thing is now, now they're all in management. They've all got them decisions, they? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now they will know. They all know. <laughs> well, it's a they, cruel they game of football though, isn't it? It's, you know, it's not one for the, for the light-hearted. You need to be strong in the game. You, you, you do. those and decisions. I, you, you do. And I, I, um, I offered roles to Chrissy Hargreaves, you see. So when Chrissy... I mean, God, I mean, he could, he could go forever, couldn't he, Chris? Let's be honest. I mean, he looked mm -hmm. after himself. He's a great pro. But there was coming a time, just like when I was Exeter, and I transitioned into being player assistant. I wanted that. I felt mm. the time was right, and I, I offered Chris that role. It wasn't for him at the time, okay? Because when you, when you come out of being a player, the money didn't half drop. Mm. Yeah. The money, yeah. the money, the money, there's no money in coaching early on, right? It's a new profession. You're starting a new profession. Yeah. And I, I, hmm. I, 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 you've got to learn it. You've got to learn it. You've got to have a chance. Even then, yeah. it might not go right. So I tried that with Chrissy, and it weren't for him. Um, and he wrote me an email, actually. I say it might have been about a year and a half ago now, maybe a bit longer. Brilliant email. Because he's had time to reflect yeah. on my decision. Amazing. On my decision, you see. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that was that was the process. It was it was clean. It was I, I if I knew if I knew there was no future for the player, I'd tell him. I have to tell him. Yeah. That's a that's a nice thing to to consider though. I think it's um it shows a bit more respect, you know, doing it one to one and and Most actually taking the time out to speak to them. So you mentioned obviously that you um you were at the under twenty three Southampton. What was the yeah. environment? like there compared to you know like a league two club and um who were some of the players that you saw there that you thought would um you know shine in the future well it was night and day <laughs> <laughs> night and yes. day okay so that gives you a clue um in terms of facility and resource unbelievable it's like the national yeah. football it was unbelievable it's everything and more that's the reason why I travelled 6,000 miles to take the job. I wanted to learn again. I wanted to, to look at how they're doing it now at this level and with their history at, at Southampton. And I was assisting again, you see. Like, so I sometimes believe in doing full circle. Mm. You know, I really enjoy, used to enjoy assisting and I never really wanted to be a gaffer, a manager. Uh, I love developing players. Uh, and I, I think I proved that during while I, man while I managed teams to try and get wins. I did halfway for young players any club I've worked at so I felt very much at home it was the facility was unreal the, I was able to work really well in the environment I was working with a, with a coach called Rally Jaidi 
yeah. who I've now actually I've oh. now actually put him in a club over here. I've oh, put wow, over nice. here now. Yeah, yeah. I've uh, I've done an affiliation with Hartford Athletic, which is a USL team here. It's just outside New York with Southampton. I affiliated the two clubs. So when I when I left, I thought it'd be a good affiliation because yeah. they, um, you know, to, to, to loan players, give them a different experience, different environment. So, um, but anyway, yeah, the, the, the environment was unreal. I got, I learned loads. I think when you're a manager, you can stop learning. I really do because there's just so much going on. So I learned loads. <clears throat> I'm a better coach now. I'm a better manager for being at Southampton. And I saw a big, I suppose I saw a big, uh, a lot of things that I, I liked that I agreed with. So we, the 23's office was right alongside Ralph's office, the head coach. Ralph okay. yeah, right. Right. Yeah. The interaction was really good. Really, really good. Massive, massive uh, on respect, you know, and their core values I 100% agree with. So, and, and it was put into action, guys. Like I saw it on a daily basis. So you can do a PowerPoint, you can put stuff up on a wall and say, this is who we are and this is how we behave. And, and, and then really and truthfully, don't do that, right? Mm. You don't do that, especially after a defeat where you start to behave different. What I saw yeah. with Southampton was the respect, the unity, aspiration, innovation, discipline, that their core values. And, um, and I liked that and it was all in. It was all in. It was, you know, if you went and got, got your food, which was unreal. It was like five-star dining. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't even know the players trained after eating that much food. But um, the ladies, the ladies behind there and the chefs, the guys, it's just together. And I always wanted yeah. that. I always felt that was important. Close-knit family. Yeah, in much. an environment. And the players were very good. Although, in my opinion, they needed more time on, this, on the grass. Yeah. Right? I made that because um, I was asked my opinion on development. And I was heavily involved in it. And I, um, I saw things straight away, like Will Smallbone. I know it's saying it now because, they're, because they're, they're, they've made their debuts. Nathan Teller, Will Smallbone. Because we spoke regularly, like with Matt Hale, who's great academy director there. We spoke regularly about the players. And they, yeah. they do a lot, a lot of player reviews, which I found really interesting. I wasn't, I wasn't a, lover, a lover of meetings. Mm. Right? It's, that's like, yeah. Meetings. But, I saw the benefit of it, right? The needs, the players and the clarity and the daily interaction, especially with the 23s, because you've got, there's a lot going on with the 23s. You've got, you've got Fraser Forster maybe coming down to train yeah. with, with the 23s from the yeah. first team, for example. Okay. Um, you've then got 18s that are coming up. So what does it look like for them? They're coming in, you know, all, mm. you know, starry eyed. You've got the 23 that hasn't been promoted to the first team, but has seen two of his colleagues go. How's he looking? So, yeah. so you've got this mixed bag in the 23s where you've really got to use your people skills and your man management skills to get them where they need to be to, to train that day and mm. set, put the right session on. So there was so much to think about, which I loved and enjoyed. And, um, but the message was clear about being on the training field and tr in, all, in all of the, in all of the, um, the player development plans and the interviews with the players, they'd always say to them, you know, was you the first one out this morning? Have you been on the heading ball if you're the centre back? You know, um, are you practising your finishing? Are you pra it was always, always the same things. And I think being unrelenting in that, you can develop players and people because yeah. a year can go so quickly when yeah, you're doing yeah. anything in life. Um, and also getting underneath that bit of peer pressure where the player might be a little bit embarrassed to, to go out. Right? So say, say you guys there, right? You're all very tight-knit. and I watch the players come out onto the training field and go back together and get in the car. I used to try and break that up a little bit. I try mm. and break it up a bit and yeah. say, say uh, James, can you be out in the training field half an hour before your pals? Yeah. yeah or, are they, or, are they, or are they, they going to look down on you or take the piss out of you? Or are they going to... You know, or do you care mm. too much about what they think? Do you need mm. do you need them to hold your hand as you come out, right? Totally. Because what <laughs> what, what what happened? Yes, what yes, happened, Paul. <laughs> yeah, well, what happened is they started to they start to do it, and guess what? They may start to do take the piss for a bit, but then they're out there with him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so you yeah. get this rip, you get this ripple effect, which um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, it's hev heaven, trutch. I mean, the pit, the pitches. The facility is unbelievable, guys. And actually, like the analysis and everything <clears throat> is is first class. Top notch, Southampton, yeah. But Southampton do, they do try to get their young ones in in the first team. And credit to them for that, because I mean, the Premier League, there's 
it's, it's uh, it's unreal. Yeah. Honestly. Well, talking about the um, development at Southampton, obviously you moved to the United States um, to go to Metropolitan Oval, which is like a development system for New York FC. Obviously, they were a the brand new franchise team out there. Um, mm. What was it like there? Because you were the technical director, wasn't you? <laughs> I, I love the way you say that. I actually <laughs> didn't move from Luton to go to Met Oval. There's no Did disrespect to Met Oval or just Saunders, who was the sporting director, because it would, yeah, it was, it was a million miles away from yeah. what I'd been doing. Yeah. The fact was, the truth was, I found it difficult to find work. Yeah. Wow. Right? End of story. I mean, I spoke to the LMA. The, the PFA, I spoke to people that knew America, and no one really knows America until they're in it. Mm. It's totally, totally different. So I had to start again. And it's the best thing that happened to me. I had to start again because what it taught me is it, the game doesn't owe you anything. And I think, mm. I think that's a mistake sometimes players can make. They think it owes them something you know, when they're finished. Right. Oh, I'll be a coach now. No, no, no. Sometimes you get that, but it doesn't last very long, in my opinion. You, mm. You've got to, you to know it. And I didn't know the United States. I didn't, yeah. I, didn't know, I didn't know high school system. I didn't know collegiate system. I didn't know USL. I didn't know MLS. I didn't know nothing. I didn't know how big the country was. So yeah. I turned up there, obviously, with, with my wife, who's working for a big, big TV company with the Premier League, with NBC, and she's fine. She, but I had a drive in me to, to work and to keep the standards up that I'd set in my career. And... Um, being overqualified, fellas, it's not a nice feeling in a, in a job. But what, I had to get on with it. And Matt Oval was a great place for me. I stayed there 18 months. And it was on its knees, you see. It was a little bit, a little bit like Torquay, right? It lost direction. And I took over that with some really good coaches that were in there. Yeah. And we transformed it. We transformed it. And no doubt about it. Put the hours in. And I knew if I kept doing that, I believed that I would get my opportunity. And I did. I did in the end, but at least I was then able to, to tell a story in America rather than keep talking about Torquay or Luton or whatever. Yeah, it was then sure. America. Um, and that's why I took the American pro license, you know, um, as well. So, cause I think we're going to be here. I think we're going to stay. So yeah, it wasn't easy at all to start with, but that was a good start for me in the end. Of course. Yeah. So that obviously led on to, well, you went back to Cheltenham, didn't you? But then sticking with America, it was the Sacramento Republic where you took yes. charge of them. And uh, I was reading you got yeah. to the last 16, the, um, the equivalent of the FA Cup. Yeah. Yes. Um, was what, was that, what was that like? And who did, you, who did you play against on the lead up to there? I think Number we beat the... Ralph Salt. I think we beat Ralph Salt Lake. I've got terrible wow. memory. Wow. We, beat big Ralph Salt Lake. Smashed, big we smashed. It, it was. It was. And it's. And we smashed them at home. I think about four or five, two or something. And um, have that. <laughs> we, we had eleven thousand every week in the st- in, in 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 the stadium. Oh wow! But but you mentioned to, just to step back once. I went to Cheltenham. I got offered that job out of the blue. Hmm. And that's a so funny because because like when you talk about management and you talk about our people perception and that was amazing because I went into there. And I obviously, I obviously wasn't content. I got shared with it, right? So I said to Rebecca, like, I want to take it. I want to go back to short spell and I want to turn it around. They've been losing lots of games. Mark had gone, Mark Yates. And I wanted to, I thought I could do that job. I always liked Cheltenham. Whenever I went down mm. there, this is, this, is, this is very interesting for me now in, in doing what I do. So I saw Cheltenham in a certain way and they mm. saw me in a certain way. But it couldn't <laughs> have been further from the truth. I mean, I love Cheltenham as a place. Did, did, I, like, did I like what was in there? No. I like some of it, but I, I, I could see why they were losing games of football. Mm. I, didn't, I didn't need... And what in the end, when I spoke to Paul before I left, I was like, you know, did you not, did you not think, you know, because, oh, you've upset this play, you've upset play. Yes, Paul, yeah, I've upset the players. Yes, I've done that. <laughs> we've not won in 14 games. What do you think I'm going to do? What I tried to explain to him was that when they, when they took me, he said, oh, you know, your talky teams always play great. You always beat you them as a rule. Um, I said, do you, do you think it was always a bed of roses at Torquay? Do you think, yeah. do you think I never yeah. played with Chris Yargreaves or Silsey or Toddy or Guy Branson knocking down my door at half time and I took him off? I said, you're kidding me. I said, I'm coming here and 
you, you upset one or two players and it, it's all coming back to you. And I mean, unbelievable how they saw me and I saw them, if that makes sense. Yeah. 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 And so <clears throat> it was, it was, it was good to get back to America after that in a way. Um, but it just showed me again, it just showed me again that, you know, clubs can get themselves in such a pickle um, on really the basic stuff, you know, real basic sort of stuff where, you know, Torquay, I was the manager and I always thank him for that, that, you know, Alex and the board always trusted my decisions and I would live and die by them. But if you're not, if you're not given that reign, it's not difficult. It's very yeah. difficult. So, yeah, then on to Sacramento, brilliant times. We won the league. We didn't quite win the cup, but we won, we won the leagues. We had a run in... Run, run in the cup as I always have good cup runs that's something that Taggy always laughed at me about he's like yeah. can you come down yeah. to Exeter and give us a cup run <laughs> <laughs> come and get us a you know, the, mon- the money the money gets involved <laughs> in it you know the, the, yeah. the talkie the talkie um, age used to love them cup runs um, but <laughs> I, had, I had a great I had a great time at Sacramento it's a brilliant club it's going to go MLS next season oh, um, wow. and we still live here we still live in this area I love the area I uh, love the location, everything. So, yeah, that was mm. yeah, brilliant to, 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 to work in a different culture. And I had to adapt. I had to, I had to change to their way of thinking, really. I mean, it was good, great for me because that's not the English way, is it? That's not our way, really. Um, no. So, so I've, I've, I've learned a lot. And when, I think when I came back to Southampton, I really was a better coach. I was a be- better person, a better coach from that experience at Sacramento. Yeah, yeah. What's, what's, so, obviously, you're saying that um, Sacramento, they're going to be put into the MLS um, next season. How does that all work? Because there's obviously no relegation system, is there, in the, in the United States? No. no. Um, do you think that will perhaps be implemented in the future? Or do you think they'll just stick with what they've got or how they have it? So, so, so um, Sac- Sacramento, so it's all about markets. Okay, okay, so Don Garber, who, uh, you know, who runs MLS, they're mm. looking for markets as where football can, can really grow. And so yeah. if you look at Cincinnati, you've got a French franchise. So Cincinnati was in USL for one season. Yeah. And I nearly, I nearly went to Cincinnati, actually. I get on very well with the owners there. I, I nearly went. Um, great club, big fan base, sporting city, you know. So that would be a, a, a franchise that MLS wanted, and they made it clear. Mm. So you would get these these cities so you get an owner like warren smith who was the owner of sacramento okay he just founded it it's amazing so so he's sitting in a bar um with his pal and he's like sacramento needs a, a soccer team as we say mm. so he's a soccer team mm-hmm. and unbelievable sets a soccer team up never felt to get twenty thousand <laughs> in the first match that's right fuck, that is insane right? yeah <laughs> right it gets twenty thousand right in there you can go you google it twenty thousand in the building that shows the markets there right mm, so obviously yeah You'd like to think MLS are going to look at that. You bought a franchise back then for about 500000 right? They're now worth about $6 million to buy the franchise and get going. Yeah. So Warren then takes that forward. Um, you then start to bid. So then there'll be like four teams maybe trying to get, get the um, next slot in MLS. So Cincinnati, St. Louis, Sacramento. And basically, a lot of money's involved. Okay, mm. so, so to money to get in there the monies that's needed for a brand new stadium. And Sacramento have had to wait. They've had to wait a bit longer, but they, they got in. So that's how it works. It's markets. Yeah. It's money. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a good league. But USL is really doing well. I don't know if you remember Jake Edwards, the old striker at Exeter. Mm. I remember Jake Edwards, remember, yeah. Remember, remember Jake? Jake he's the president of USL and done unbelievable, oh, no doing an unbelievable job. Yes. That's, got that's crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> Why word? Treated him well at Exeter. Yeah, I was gonna say he likes well, you now. <laughs> do you remember when? Uh, <laughs> when, uh, when Joe Cole went over there, Joe Cole went yes. to the US. Yeah, yeah. That was that, I Cole. couldn't believe it. Yeah, I could not I believe it. Colton Cole. Yeah. <laughs> you signed him. Oh, signed oh, him. Cole. Yeah. <laughs> What's that he like? Unbelievable. He's different class. Yeah. Absolutely. The, the tell you what, a different class. Yeah, Col- Colton came over. We signed him for a few games near the end of the season. Um, lost in the playoffs, actually. He scored his penalty, though. We lost on penalties. Mm. Um, Didier Drogba come and train with us for two weeks. That was oh, unreal. Oh, my word. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my Didier word. Didn't so have said you'd run the football, session. <laughs> Graham Smith, yeah. who's a great director of football. Um, he used to play for West Brom and Colchester. He was a goalie. Graham was the director of football at Sacramento. And... Mm. Uh, 
he, he says, Paul, we've had, a, we've had a phone call from Montreal. Can Didier Drogba come and have some warm weather training with us? And he thought, <laughs> he, he thought I was going to say no, you know, being all, oh. you know, focused on the game and all that. Yeah, so, yeah. Can he come? Of course he can come. <laughs> <laughs> can fucking drive him here. I don't want to train him. So he 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 had like some different options, but he chose us. And he come in, I mean, what a figure. He comes in, the lads, you know, and then Didier come trained every day. Mm. He uh he couldn't he couldn't play on the AstroTurf. Uh Montreal had a few games AstroTurf, couldn't do it with his knee. So he come in. He didn't have one day off. So even when I give the chaps a day off, he wanted to come in. So I got I got the pleasure of working with him one on one. Trust me, I was up all night getting my best ever finishing session up. <laughs> <laughs> <Right in it. laughs> and, uh, he was he was fantastic. One he come to me on um he come to me on a I think it was a Thursday and he said, Paul, it's my birthday tomorrow. Can I take mm. the players out? <laughs> what? I said, Of course you can. Go for it. Yeah, just go for it. <laughs> it was a real unique situation to have somebody like that. Um, and you know what an influence and what a you know a leader and everything. And he ended up at Phoenix. I think he's got maybe, maybe an, in, an invested in Phoenix rising now. Yeah. But yeah. The, the game, the growth of the game is massive. And USL, Jake Edwards has done an unbelievable job. And he is going to bring in. I think he's looking to bring in relegation promotion. He's looking to bring that model in. That would be can't brilliant. Say, can't can't say that too loud. I'm not sure the American <laughs> people can get that. <laughs> yeah. um, you know. I love, oh, yeah. I absolutely love the MLS. Like, not many people like it over here, but I don't know. I just, there's something about the fans out there that are just intriguing. Like, they go mental for it. I absolutely mm. love it. And to think, you know, I remember seeing a video of the MLS with their, penalty, their old school penalty shootouts. Do you remember them? Where they yeah. used to run yeah. from the halfway yeah. line. Yeah. 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 And I'm like, how much the game has changed out there now? And it's, it's great. it is great to see. And you've seen like, some big-name players go over there. How, when it, with the youngsters coming through out there, what's it like, um, what, as you say, when you first went over there with the high school system, things like that, what mm. is all of that like? How much well, of a difference is it to here? Oh, it's really different. It's really mm. refreshing. And like I say, I yeah. had to get used to that. The players come in, good morning, sir, morning, sir. They're so respectful. I'm not saying that the English guys ain't, but we're quite miserable. I was miserable in England at times. <laughs> yeah. in America, you know. <laughs> so deep breath in the car, morning, Tony, morning, Greasy, morning. You know, they, they just do it naturally. They, they, and it's sort of a different way. They don't, they get disappointed losing, but they don't stop the beal and end all. Does that make sense? They sort of move on yeah. pretty quick, which is really healthy. Yeah. Yeah, and when you're right, when we um, I tell you what took me a bit of getting used to. So we didn't lose too many games at Sacramento, but when we did lose at home, the expectation was to go right up to the fans, cuddle them, go right in with them. I was on the way. In. Yeah, I was on the way into the uh, to the dressing room. Of course, you know, <laughs> if you was at Luton and you was one nil down, they'd let you know in no uncertain terms. You, you'd be <laughs> a brick. And, a brick. Not here, not here. <laughs> They're going to get a hot dog. Get some popcorn, <laughs> you know, with two nil down. It's okay, Paul. Don't worry about it. Smile, man. <laughs> yeah. oh, that's some bad luck, buddy. <laughs> and it's like, what? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, I had to get used to that. But what a healthy culture. What mm. a healthy culture, right? Um, so, yeah, I, I learned a lot from that. The players, the young players, they're, they're remodeling the system now. Jake's doing a great job, like I said. They're, they're making all the USL clubs now have academies. So yep. there's a pathway, a clear pathway through That's for the brilliant. players. Um, players can actually could actually leave here for nothing. So German clubs have really took advantage. You know, oh, really? there's yeah, players just leaving for yeah. no 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 fees. I mean, you know, this is where here we have to be better at that now. And then things are going to be put in place. So the clubs that I'm with now and that I advise, it's like, listen, if we've got a young player that we like, we've got to sign him. Yeah, we got. I signed a 15 year old on a pro contract at, at Sacramento. <laughs> Because that just one, one I thought it was good enough, but two, it just stopped him being poached. Yeah, yeah. So you know, it's, it's, you can sign him on a pro at fifteen, really, isn't it? Like, to mm, think, yeah, yeah. Smart. But there's nothing in place. There's no sort of contract in place that can stop a player just leaving. Um, yeah. and, and market here. I mean, the market in North in in NorCal where I live, like the market here, it's it's probably the it's probably the best region in the whole of America for talent. Mm. Um, so now we're basically getting 
the model in place, we're getting the pathway for the player. Um, and I think very shortly the days will be gone where someone could just come and take take, take a player. And of course, yeah. with Brexit and everything now, um, markets now for a Premier League club now looking for talent, they're going to look in America now mm, yeah. because you know you can't you used to be able to bring the players in at 16. You're not going to be able to do that anymore from from Europe. It's going to be 18. So the American market will come in into that. And, and I've spoken with Premier League clubs about the talent here because there's huge talent here. Yeah, and they they've mm. got a real big work ethic as well. The young American players, they really do work hard, and they've got. A, I think the I think the collegiate system here is really good because they they get so in England. I think at 16, 18, you're asked to be a man, a fully grown man, and right yeah. in America, in America, you're just going to college at 18. So they're mm. coming out. They're co- they're really they've lived. They've they've had different experiences. They've grown up. They're coming out of college at 21, 22. Yeah. And yeah. I've, seen, I've seen the value in that. And they're coming out with qualifications because, as you know, there's no guarantees in football. So I think it's a good system. Yeah. Mm. Do you think you'll stay as like a technical advisor for the rest of your career? Or do you, would you like to get back into management? I have, I have no hunger. I don't get up in the morning and really miss the training field. I really mm. don't. I love, I love working with the players and developing, as, as I said, but I don't. I don't get up and go, oh God, I really miss management. I really, you know, mm. I, I, I don't because I'm very happy with the, the five clubs I've been at. Thank them all for employing me and, and everything. But I've learned so much in that time yeah. that could be put yeah. to good use now. I really yeah. can. I, mm. I, I, I believe this, the most important relationship in a football club is the owner and the head coach. And, and I'm not going to say all clubs, but look, there can be a big, that's the first thing that falls over. Big disconnect, hmm. big big yeah. disconnect, and once and so my job is to really a lot of profiling, a real serious profiling on who and why, who you're going to bring in and why, right? Once we identify the the, the the candidates, really talk with them, really let them know who we are. So push a club and an owner to be very specific in what they want, yeah, and who they are, and then you've got a chance, haven't you? You've got a chance of it working. Yeah, and I, I, that's 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 a strategy that I work on. Then once once it's in place, it's you know what next? Because you know if you look at Torquay, and I have to go back to it as a model. They they got money for me in the end, Torquay. They sold me mm. to Bristol Rovers, right? Now for me, that's total success to sell your manager right. because the majority yeah. of the time they're paying them off. Mm. Yeah, How many sure. clubs just see either that's paying it. players off? Or paying managers off, and it's mismanagement. Yeah. So I'm 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 all about now the right fit. Where's the right fit and why? You know, and really really digging deep into that because it's not beneficial for a club or a manager if it's not right from the outset. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's got to um, be the right thing for you. It re- it really has, and of course, it, it, with me with what way over 200 games for Torquay United and then 28 for Rovers. I learned a lot. I've mm. learned an awful lot. So I basically now sit alongside the owners, work with them. Uh, if, if, if the head coach, like with Raddy, for example, if he wants my input, of course I'll give it. Yeah. I think I know, I know how managers would feel after a defeat, after a win. Yeah. After, um, yeah. And, and make the clubs forward think because if you look at, and I can say it, I can say it, and of course I can. If you look at the four years and then with Martin after me at Torquay, against probably the lot, not until Gary's coming, and I'm not down in any gaffers that have been in there because they've been to good men. There, was, there didn't seem to be any direction to me from the outside. Yeah. So to go yeah. from 90 minutes from League One to the Conference South, mm. boy, boy, there must have been a lot go in between that. In between, do you, do you, do you yeah, 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 they they just ended up going from from this level, then down to Conference South, it. and you're thinking, yeah. how is it's club like Torquay with the structure they have in place ended up in the Conference South? It just shouldn't be happening. Well, that's it. You see, the structure is the key thing because if the club doesn't know who they are, mm. they've got no chance, in my opinion. So you have to accept who you are. You have to accept that Torquay you're going to get two to four thousand crowds, right? As a rule. Yeah. You're going to have to accept that we need a cut run. We need a cut run. 
So the manager you're bringing in, you, you just look at all of his, uh, you know, look at his whole history, look at what he's done. And I don't think, I, don't, I say it, I don't think I look deep enough into it to try to, 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 to get the success. And once the structure's in place, you see, you choose managers to come in and work with that structure, refine that structure, add to it, not take away, not bring in their own new bit, their own new staff. It all mm. changes around. Because it's money. Sure. The, the, the money and, and the, the out it gives the players, because it gives the players a chance, and oh, I don't like this manager, and, and I'm going to you know, go. It's, it's, it's now at Hartford, for example, has a clear identity, clear, mm. clear model in place, right? Uh, a salary, a budget, an age of player that we sign, the head coach that we've got. So the next head coach we bring in, we'll be able to show you who we are. Right, yeah. yeah. And how Actually, we work, yeah. right? And how we do things. So when Martin came in behind me, I thought that was a smart move. Yeah. Mm. I could see that. I don't know what happened inside, but I, all I know is over four years, as I said to you, I, it, it was good for me because I knew the club. I knew Devon, so I knew the West Country. I knew the clubs, if I was going for a player, what other clubs would be going for him. I, I knew what we could and couldn't do. Um, we had regular board meetings, so there was great communication. I sold players straight. Even when we were doing well, I sold Benyon. And yeah, in my opinion, exactly. in, my, in my opinion, when Danny Wilson, when I agreed on deadline that evening, down in Shoulder, I was on the phone. <laughs> going back to going back to Ian Amon saying I've got him to 125. He's sell him, sell him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get um, rid of him. You know, and then Simon, that the, Simon and the, the, the two the two chairmen I worked with, Alex and Simon, were great because they're great people, and the, the consortium were great. But the fact that I was willing to sell my striker told him that I was looking at the club's interest. Yeah, um, for right? sure. And and, yeah. He, and he came back. He, he literally came on the phone straight after and said, "I'll take Billy Key as well." And he wanted Billy for 125 as well. I got, wow. and I went, and I went back, and Simon's like, "No way, absolutely no chance," because the fans, and probably rightly so. But mm. what what I had set up at Torquay was young players coming in, pathway for them, so working them really hard behind the scenes, not letting them go home uh, with the pros, working in the afternoons, and then them coming in. So when you look at the midfield with Nicky Rowe being sold, which was good yeah. business, because I because I was able then to get couple of good loans in as well um and then having Lathrope coming through with O'Kane okay and Chrissy Argrees moving on there was a clear plan and what that was doing is bringing the budget right down because Damon yeah. and, and uh Damon and Una my mommy saying they weren't on big wages because yeah. they weren't in the team do you get me but I knew yeah. they were good enough to get in so always trying to find those players from Leicester like so Ellis and you know the players that we had yeah get them in mm. make sure they're ready Get them doing well. I would always do it in the press, make sure I mentioned their name, you know. Uh, Give them a bit of... Because I knew we had to sell them. Yeah. Right? And yeah. I, I was happy. I was happy with that. I was happy with that because we had the backup plan. Because when I signed Unan, really and truthfully, we didn't have anything left on the budget. <laughs> and and yeah. Unan had been... Exeter had said no. So Tiz had said no for whatever reason. He'd been let go by Everton. And Johnny Ems rung me and said, um, take a look at this player. And I was like, well, if Tiz had looked at him, like, because I trust his tits. Yeah, you anyway, trust thank God, mm. thank God I did. Thank God I did the union. <laughs> because, I mean, he come in, he walked in to my office and I thought, this is never going to work. He looked about 14. Yeah. <laughs> Skinny, little white frail boy. I thought, yeah, what the, you know, Yemsy, come on. Anyway, mm. it snowed. It bloody snowed. So we couldn't train. So we took him up on this, this AstroTurf, I think, out in, out in the sticks. And, uh, he was unreal. After 10 minutes, I couldn't get in the car quick enough to get back to the club. Just, yeah, I, wow. said, <laughs> I said, do not let him leave. Mm. I'm telling you now, we've got something special here for mm. our level, right? And where we yeah. are, and for free. And um, so, forward me, and I was like, right, uh, players, I've got you and know, okay. Uh, we need to give him a two year deal now. <laughs> of course, you got like a couple of them. What? Well, we, we, uh, so listen, <laughs> listen yeah. to me now. 200, 200 quid or whatever I put Unan on right now. Right now. Because he had that killer instinct in him. He wanted to work. He'd been hurt by, he'd had, you know, he'd been let go. And big pluses to that when you've got a player like that hungry. And he was oh, so what, good. What he was so he was. good. What a player. And, but, but moving on from that, 
when you talk about a club, it's never ending because I used to get, uh, and this is where I think Steve Perriman has done a brilliant job at Exeter. I'd get agents, I'd get, you know, oh, Newman's not happy, bye-bye. You, well, we've got someone that'll take him. What do you want for him? Bye-bye. No, don't work like that. <laughs> yeah, not interested. You bid. Yeah. You bid, right? Because when we yeah. went down to Bournemouth and beat Bournemouth in the cup, the Union played fantastically well, and so did Smithy, the right back we had on loan from Tottenham, Adam Smith. Mm, yeah. Of course, next next day you got you get in the the question and about Union and all this, and I said to the board like, that's half a million. He's half a million, mm. right? With add-ons. I'm, 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 I was fuming when I, when I, when I see the, the, the figures that some of the players were let go for, right? You know, key, okay. Oh. You're joking. You can't, oh, yeah. you can't do that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. And I've got a great enough relationship with, with people like Alex and all of that. That was a crime. The work yeah. that had gone into Union, the work that had gone into him, the work he'd put in, half a million, okay? And I could see he was a Premier League player and an international player. Yeah. And I think we got 75 grand for him. That's I think. a joke. Yeah. Well, I'm just oh, saying, nothing I, I really, think. isn't it? So, yeah, so, yeah. so if, you've, if you've got your policy in place and it's like concrete, that don't happen. Because that, that, that can keep you afloat for a couple of seasons, two yeah. or three seasons, right? Yeah. And mm. it's proved a successful model. That was a successful model. And I always told the board, right? I, 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 I can't promise you wins. I can't promise you promotions, but this will be run financially right. And we will have a pathway to six, always five to six development players. Yeah. It's a budget down, yeah. right? And we, we, we've got to go and try and find them and sell them on, right? That's what we do. And um, even, like I say, with the older players, we sold as well. So for me, for me, didn't follow the model, didn't have a clear vision. And that's when you can get yourself in real trouble. And that's what I'm trying to guard against with the people I work with now. 100%. I think mm. that's bang on. I was just going to ask you one more question, Paul, really, just before we sort of um, wrap it up. I was just going to say, obviously, you're saying you had Billy Key, of course, and, and what a player he is on his day and was on his day. Mm. Um, have you spoke to him since, obviously, you made his decision to, to retire from football? Yeah, I have, yeah. How, yeah is he OK? Uh, so, He's getting on the right. Yeah, I think Bill's working on the building site now. Oh, um, why not? Now, is he? Um, yeah, yeah, and probably from the outside, you're thinking what? But, but maybe that's where he's, he's happiest. Uh-huh. And, um, yeah. Okay, and there's a lot to be said for it. And I, as much as I, as much as I spoke with the players, and I'd like to think I was there for them, and I did, and I said it before. I love love the players, and I love the young players, and I really felt what they were going through. Bill, Bill used to, and that might be the only one that I let. I let Torquay off with Billy because Billy went back home to Burton but I still would have made Pescalito uh, pay more money that's for sure but, yeah. <laughs> um, but, but Bill did miss home he did it's, and he's come out and he's been very brave very yeah, yes. very brave in what he's done and he's opened the, he's opened the door for hopefully a lot more to come and be honest about because it, it's an unforgiving profession it's very hmm. glossy from the outside at times but it really is unforgiving you yeah. know and you know and um, how aggressive it can be on the terraces and different stuff and, 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 you know, the highs and lows and all the rest of it. Some can cope with that, but obviously some can't. And I, you probably haven't got the time as a manager every day to really focus on that because you've got 25 of them to look after. But Bill, it's incredible because he was such a brave player, Billy Key. And what I mean by that is always show for the ball. He was yeah. so low maintenance. Low maintenance. So I, remember, I remember when we was going when he was doing really well in that last season, playing arguably some of the best football that's been, that's been played at Playmore for a number of years, you know, probably from, since Leroy's days and all that. But we, that team was so good. And I remember wanting to play four strikers. Because, yeah. you know, it was so exciting having, having Lathrop and O'Kane in the middle, total football. And I think it was like Jake Robinson, I want to say, uh, you probably better remember it better than I, Billy Key, Zebs, and I think it was, um, I think it was the other, the other black lad I had on, on loan, Gavin Tomlin. Mm. I've got mm. four strikers and I want to, I want to play them all. I'm sitting yeah. in the office thinking, I, I want to play them all of these, but none yeah. of them are wingers. Really, Jake might have been, but I liked him anyway. So I got them all in, and I said, I want to, I want to play you all, but I, I need to know that if 
Kev's getting taken on, right? Or or Robbo or Mance on the other side. You you one of you's got to do a shift. And, yeah. and Key was the first one to put his hand up because I said I want you to go everywhere with the ball. When we lose it, I need two out and you know get the shape. And Key was just he led that. Billy it's Key tireless, was like, okay, yeah. I'll tireless. That. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that, Paul. You know, and you'd see Key Key on the left, Key on the right. Yeah, I mean, he was brilliant to work with. But I'm, I'm so happy because I tried to bring him here. So when I was a Republic manager, mm. I, went, I went and met him in Leicester or wherever he was, him and his girlfriend, beautiful family, and took Graham with me, Graham Smith. We was over doing a recce in England because he would have scored bundles here. Bill, yeah. was a, Bill was a goal scorer. He would have scored so many goals. And, um, but I tell you what, he looks happy. There's something to be said for that. He looks really happy now. I'm pleased for him. And he's, he's had a career. He's had a really he good career, hasn't he? Um, he has. He's been lethal, lethal, sure has. lethal goal scorer. And again, yeah. he's proved for me. So like someone like Key, I mean, he was let go by Leicester, weren't he? Yeah. Um, mm. When you look at, look at the players that get released, you know, we started, we talked about my career at the start, is you don't have to take a lot to get back. Yeah. It sure. takes an awful yeah. lot to get back. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm pleased. He's, I'm really pleased that he's happy. That's all that matters. No, that's great. I think that's a yeah, that's that's a true. lovely note to finish on, Paul. Um, yeah, it is. Yeah. It just, just obviously, uh, I mean, we want to say a massive thank you to you. I know, obviously, this is this is during your day, so it makes things a little bit easier for you. But obviously, you've taken your time to, to come on to the Max Talks podcast. We really appreciate the time you've mm. given us, mate. Um, I've loved it. I've, I've loved it. No, that listen, I've, I've loved it, and I, and, I, and I don't get an opportunity that much to convey, you know, what it's like to be a manager and, you know, where you've come from. So I've really, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you for having me on and, and keep doing the good work that you're doing because I love listening to them. Oh, Lovely, mate. Thanks Lovely. so much. We, Cheers, yeah, we'll love to stay in contact and we'll definitely stay in contact with you. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. If we ever yeah. come over to you or you come I'm over sure. here, we'll, <laughs> we'll come to <laughs> <Of course. laughs> course, I'm sure there's course. many more stories as well for you to tell so Absolutely. get you back Absolutely. on Monday that'd be great well yeah. this has been the yeah. Max Talks podcast and we will see you again very soon thank you very much cheers, cheers, cheers. stay well take care